you're in the prime of your life, you're full of, you know, youth and beauty, and you go out to challenge the world and people die. And, and that's part of the, part of the draw. Like, you don't know if you're going to, what's going to happen. Hello and welcome to episode two of the Who Cares Anyway podcast, a series of interviews with musicians, writers, artists, and other creative figures on topics related to the book Who Cares Anyway, Post-Punk San Francisco, and the End of the Analog Age on Head Press Books. My guest for this episode is Kim Seltzer, and I'll begin by reading from the brief bio on her website. I spent my youth in northern Italy, studied painting and illustration in San Francisco, and for many years lived in Manhattan. I meticulously paint beautiful inhabitants of a liminal world where all is not as it seems. I am the bastard offspring of Belle Epoque symbolists and occultists. I have no home in this world. Now, when I first reached out to Kim Seltzer, it was in 2018, and that was to interview her for the book, specifically about her involvement with Toiling Midgets in the early 1980s. She did the album art for Sea of Unrest and did a lot of their other visuals, including flyers and projections that were used during their live shows at times. But I did not know really much of anything else about her, and... It turns out that she's done a lot of other interesting stuff since then, and so this interview was sort of an opportunity to get into some of that stuff while connecting back into some of the more directly book-related content, but it sort of winds its way around and uh, perhaps connects some dots that aren't often uh, connected. Now, one bit of explanation might be in order, given that what you're about to hear is edited down from a longer conversation. So there's a little bit of missing context. The Gomez referred to near the end is or was one Luis Gomez, a painter, artist who lived at the A-hole, which is mentioned earlier on in the interview. But Gomez died under mysterious circumstances. Different people related different versions of that story or interpretations of what might have happened. And that does appear in one of the chapters, I believe chapter 19. I think the rest of it explains itself as it goes, so I'll go ahead and get out of the way. But for more on Kim Seltzer's art, you can go to kimseltzer.com or kimseltzerart.com, and then I'll put other links in the show notes, including to Exit Magazine, Sea of Unrest, and other related tidbits. You know, I was going back through the interview we did a few years ago, and I I couldn't... um quite remember. I didn't have anything uh, that I had transcribed about what brought you to San Francisco and whether it was the Art Institute or something else. Oh, well, I was, um, I went to the Academy of Art, which was a commercial art school. I had been living overseas in Northern Italy. That's where I went to high school. And my dad was in the military and he got um, stationed at Fort Ord, California in Salinas in the Monterey, Monterey County. So I was uh, living in Salinas and finishing up high school. I was in like my last year of high school and I was um, having really bad culture shock, as you can well imagine. And so when, you know, high school was over, I I just figured I'd go to uh, college in San Francisco. So that's how I ended up there. Now, oddly enough, a lot of my friends from Italy ended up living in San Francisco. So before I met, uh, the midgets. I was actually just hanging out with people from Northern Italy. It was kind of weird. Did you get there in 80 or? Oh, uh, no, I actually, I actually moved to San Francisco in 78. Oh, okay. So, um, but I was not involved in, I was, you know, I was super committed to college and I hadn't yet started running wild. So I didn't know any punk rockers. I didn't, I wasn't really interested in music. So I didn't go to any shows or anything. Um, subsequently, you know, I did know people that went to the Art Institute, but you know, it was, um, I, I always have been a, a serious painter and part of that is actually knowing how to draw and <laughs> nobody learned how to draw at the Art Institute. <laughs> even, even I knew that then, <laughs> so. 
Um, the, yeah, there, there was definitely a big division. I'm really glad I didn't go to the Art Institute because they were all doing abstract expressionist paintings because all their teachers were old beatniks. So did you do all four years at the Art Institute, at the, um, not the Art Institute, <laughs> the Academy of Art? I did do, I yes, I, I did. I was there for all four years. And um, actually, but in my very last um, semester, I dropped out. So I never actually officially got my degree, which was stupid of me. But at that point, I didn't think it mattered. Uh, did you, I mean, did you like the school as far as what, what you learned there? Oh, yeah, it was fabulous. We had great teachers, a lot of uh, really famous illustrators and um, great anatomy teachers and great drawing teachers. Yeah, it was great. I loved it. I, I just, you know, when I, once I met uh, like the midgets and I started getting involved in that uh, scene in San Francisco, I just completely lost my focus as a lot of people did. And I just, you know, went off the rails. Probably not as much as some, some people did, but. No, uh, I was, yeah, I, no, I did pretty bad, but I was, even when I was in my worst, I was always under control, but um, yeah, it was a great, it was a great school. I, I, I love that school. And I was in, um. I was in, there was a well-known show in my last year of school, um, the uh, San Francisco Armory show. I don't know if we discussed that, but uh, it was uh, these old um, hippies uh, that were part of uh, the Oracle. You know, the Oracle magazine from San Francisco that uh, like these beatniks and hippies put out in the heyday of the summer of love. Yeah, it's familiar. I had, I've never actually seen any uh, issues of it, but it's it's familiar. It's, it's yeah, it's famous. And so one of the fa one of the people involved with it was uh, this artist Michael Bowen, who was a well known, uh, you know, hippie San Francisco painter. He was one of the people who put on this um, show. So I was in that show and I got I actually got written up in the San Francisco Chronicle. So that was a big deal. Okay. And was there, um, uh, I don't know, rivalry is the right word between um, the different uh, philosophies in terms of the Art Institute versus the Academy of Art? Oh, or... yeah. To yeah, totally. Because everybody, everybody, well, I, you know, I believe, I believe that I don't want to make like blanket statements. Yeah, they, because uh, the, the Academy of Art was a commercial art school. People that were going there were expecting to make a living from art. And, uh, you know, people who went to the uh, Art Institute, they were all artists, and I'm using air quotes. You know, they were doing art for art's sake. And everybody at the Academy was, uh, you know, going to make a living. Except for me, one of my teachers said to me, um, I'm assuming that you have a trust fund. <laughs> <laughs> based on my behavior I think. <laughs> because I, I've always been you know I've always been a really pure artist but um and I've always made a lot of assumptions about you know the level of success I'm going to achieve but yeah there was yeah there was definitely um you know people at the art institute you know didn't take people that went to the academy of art seriously okay yeah but I don't, you know, I think most, you know, it, it's, it, I studied illustration. The Academy of Art taught illustration. And that was that was the heyday of illustration. I don't know if you recall, but that was like when illustration was really great. But a lot of people that went there were doing graphic design and, you know, traditional commercial art. They were even starting to do a uh, computer art. And a, a, a friend of mine was like, you should take the computer art classes. And I'm like, computer art's never going to amount to anything. <laughs> me a little bit about this and something to do with a sandwich shop but how you um got mixed up with the the midgets and then how you um got into doing the the visuals well um it's, it's kind of it's kind of fate is a funny thing um i lived on golf and market which is at the where hate meets uh market street and um which is kind of interesting 
And uh, Paul was working in a sandwich shop that was around the corner. And I went in there one day and uh, just we just started talking. And then uh, we started going out. And, um, and that's how I met the Toiling Midget. So up until that point, I was very straight, straight lay, super serious, um, you know, art student. And I, um, I worked, I, I actually had a job in a law office with these really uh, right wing Republican lawyers. And uh, so I was, I was very straight laced. And that's when I met Paul, but I had just gone, I just broken up with, I had a very bad boyfriend one in a long series of them and I just broken up with him and I was um I just you know he was very uh controlling so I was tired of just doing everything the right way right I was tired of having to look a certain way and act a certain way and I was uh just kind of uh I think I yeah I was starting to I had a friend from the Academy of Art and we had started going out. We had started going out and making posters and putting them up. And I think that's before I met Paul. So I think I was just starting to make a little foray into the punk lifestyle. And we were very, very young and we'd go out late at night and South of market, uh, putting up posters and, you know, really disgusting alleyways. <laughs> And one night, one night we were, um, we had made this poster and I had, uh, I had this uh, police target uh, poster in my uh, apartment and, you know, with that they use at the firing range. And so we had made it into a poster and we said something anti-police on it. Okay. Not, you know, not even, not even know what we're doing. So it's like after midnight, we're in this filthy alley and we're putting up these posters and all of a sudden we see these lights on us and we turn around and these cops are shining their lights on us like, what are you doing? <laughs> and um, I think that was right around the time I met Paula because I remember before that, I always wore, you know, like velvet and tweed. I was I was very much like a yuppie. But then after Paula, I started wearing... Um, stovepipe pants and a white shirt and a blue blazer and I cut my hair off and so that's what I was wearing and I wore the same thing every day and that's what I was wearing when the cops um you know asked us what we were doing in the alley so it must have been about the same time I met Paul and then I met the Toiling Midgets and then through them I started you know meeting all these uh San Francisco punk rockers and then I started uh doing um I started doing their posters. So I had started doing the posters with my friend and then I started doing posters for the Toiling Midgets. And before, I think before, I'm sorry if I'm bouncing around here and not making sense. No, no, no. But this, all this stuff happened at the same time. So I met Adam Parfrey at the same time. So I was an illustrator, right? So I was, I did have my illustrations in New West magazine and I was constantly, you know, showing myself to people. So I had my illustrations in Damage and um, and then I saw a magazine, Adam Parfrey was doing this magazine called Idea Magazine. So I reached out to him and then I met him and um, I reached out to Damage and I met a, another, person who became a good friend of mine max century he was working for them and uh, this all happened at the same time so i was doing all these illustrations and then i met the toiling midgets and i started doing uh posters for them and the posters were super popular and um we were yeah we were doing the posters kind of like telling a story because at the time i was uh doing i was very interested in serial art you know I was doing a lot of um, serial art, uh, either at, either in magazines or like in, in that kind of illustration format for posters. So we kind of did the midgets posters as if it was a continual uh, serial strip. You know, each poster would be one of the, one of the uh, sequences in the strip. 
Right. And that's, that's the same uh, style of art that's on uh, Sea of Unrest uh, in the sketches. Yes, that all. So we did the posters and, uh, and the posters were all black and white. And I did a lot of um, uh, a, a, a ink and brush uh, drawings. And um, then, then we, and then I was starting to do a lot of, um, oh yeah. So about that, I'm, that was about the time that there was a famous show in San Francisco that we did talk about the German expressionism show. Do, do you recall? Yeah. I remember, I remember mentioning that. Yeah. So about that time, which would be interesting to look up what year that was, was this big sh show and it was very influential. And I was really, I was really taken by it. Now I had come from this tradition of Europe, you know, Northern Italian, European Renaissance painting. And that was my ideal. But after the German expressionism show, you know, I was like, well, you can just do these, you know, you don't have to work so <laughs> just bright colors a lot of green and red and everything can you can just kind of throw the paint around and um and you know we were kind of living a fast lifestyle anyway so I started doing all of these acrylic paintings on paper and on anything I could get my hands on like I'd go out scavenging for wood and uh, things like that. And so I started doing all of these um, expressionistic paintings. And then, uh, and, and then we started using them as a slideshow in the shows. And then we, then they start, then they did Sea of Unrest. So I did, I did, um, I did the painting after all of that. So we had started, we were spending a lot of time hanging out south of market, roaming around and, um, we would, uh, we were, you know, there was a lot of, it was very industrial at the time. There were a lot of factories and um, we were, and the train was down there. We were always roaming around. And then I started um, painting all of these in, industrial spaces, uh, South of Market. Uh, Paul was living at the A-Hall. And um, so that's when I started going down there. And there was a famous coffee factory. I can't remember the coffee company, but I think it was Miller. It was whatever. Um, there used to be a coffee with an, an Arab guy on it. Do you remember that? You know, I I I looked it up, and I it's in the I think it's in the book. Uh, oh great! I'm trying to. Is it J something J? Um, let's see. Uh, I have to find it. I should can, remember. I it. think you can, you can probably find it based on the imagery, which was like an Arab in a long kaftan drinking a, like Turkish coffee. And I could be this could be false memory syndrome. <laughs> I could totally be making this up, but I could have sworn that was the coffee company. Anyway, they had a fabulous building, and uh, that was the building in in Sea of Unrest, and that was down by the A Hall. Right. And yeah, for anyone familiar with that part of town, that would be, uh, so it's third street. I believe the address is five twenty seven third street and it was near Brannon or Bryant or. Oh yeah. Near Bryant. Right. Yeah. It was surprising to me to hear that, you know, Oh, there, there actually were factories there because you know, everything there now is tech and people working, you know, in, in, in offices so that it wasn't that long ago that this tail end of the industry in South of market was kind of winding down. And I, I well, it, it was, you know, th this is the thing. San Francisco was a working class town and a lot of people don't realize that. And it had, and when I worked for these lawyers, they used to actually talk about that. I, I remember it clearly. They would, because this the change was just beginning, but it, it was, it, this was uh, 79, 80, 81. And they were talking about how the middle class was getting pushed out, but there was a, a concrete manufacturer. There was, yeah, there were, there was industry. There, there was this uh, U.S. steel was down there. And um it was very, very gritty. And when I first moved to San Francisco, the whole area that the Javits Center is in, they had leveled that whole area 
before they ever built, built the Moscone Center, not Javits, that's in New York. They, before they even built that, they had leveled this entire part of San Francisco, right in the heart of San Francisco, was a big empty pit where you could see the basements of 19th century buildings. It had been like, you know, like, like the rundown part of town. It was part of ur urban renewal. They just leveled the whole thing. And it just sat there like that for a long, long time. And you would just look down into it. So it was very, uh, San Francisco was very, um, they were in a big building boom. They were building up uh, all the uh, financial district. They were building all the big skyscrapers that are there now. And um, so there was constantly the sound of pylons being um, driven into the ground because, you know, you can't build in San Francisco without driving in these really deep pylons. And it would take them months to drive them in. So there was this constant sound of a pylon being driven into the ground. I don't know if you've ever heard that. It's like this ringing, booming sound. And, um, but yeah, South of Market was industrial and it was very, uh, it was very, it was very raw. It was very bleak. There were a lot of bums, you know, now they call them homeless people, but then you just call them bums. And, um, they had a skid row, you know, in it, you know, that was south of market and um, uh, yeah, it was pretty gritty. Now I, I think they put, they built up like a little mini city down there, but we used to, the, that's down where the, where the Southern Pacific Railroad was, rail yards were, right? And we used to always hang out there. I don't know why we were always hanging out in rail yards, but we used to hang out in rail yards. I moved there in 99 and, and some of my first, I had a, I had a temp job down at um, maybe 6th and Brannon. And, and so I was walking down 6th Street and just seeing sites that I would never have seen before, just in terms of urban living and, and whatnot. It was bleak. I mean, it was, it was, it was gritty as it do I get justice. Um, uh, it, but, it, was, yeah, it was gritty. And you know what? It was gray because San Francisco, most of the day is gray because it's you know has the marine uh over over whatever the marine layer that comes in and there's this brief period of time where it's clear and sunny but the san francisco bleakness of those days is is nothing like the san francisco bleakness of these days and the last time i was there was well i went to the last punk reunion so that was uh five or six or seven years ago. And then before that, I'd been there a couple of years before, but the last time I went there, I was like, dude, I don't know. I don't even want to come here anymore. It was so freaking depressing and it was just depressing and nasty. Not like the kind of bleakness it was when we lived there. That was a different thing. That was like, you felt connected to the beats and you felt connected to uh, San Francisco, you know, art history and, it had a lot of authenticity and, you know, we would go to old bars and hang out with old men. And it was very um, Jack Kerouac, you know, and we were, and also Craig's uh, big inspiration was always James Dean. And so we were all in that classic American, you know, on the road rebel type mode, you know, wearing khaki and jean jackets and white shirts and things like that and um but that was gritty but it was wonderful and the kind of thing that san francisco's turned into which portland also turned into is disgusting it's it's got none of the romance it's just gross it just gross. Like I, I have lived all over the world. I can handle all kinds of grittiness. I cannot handle the grittiness of San Francisco anymore. It's just disgusting. So all that romance has been eliminated. A little bit of grit, a couple of charming bums, you know, that's romantic. And then there's the tipping point. You know, 
I was an artist, so I knew I had to go to the city to to meet people and to uh, be an artist. You don't have to do that anymore. And we, you know, we didn't have cars. Sometimes we didn't even have phones. And we just went outside and went to shows and met people on the street, you know, just by, just like old school, like people used to do in Paris. <laughs> It's the same thing. And that's how, you know, you met people, you saw people in person. It was the same thing when I moved to New York, we, you would just leave the house, you'd go out and run into people in the East Village and you would, that's how the, you know, the day would form itself based on who you ran into. And it was the same thing in San Francisco. You know, we'd go to, we would go to each other's houses and we would spend time together. We would hang out, we would go to, go to cafes and sit in cafes and write in our journals you know the thing that made that San Francisco early 80s scene the thing it was is that everybody interacted with everyone else and and it fed it, you know you were feeding off of other people and it was very specific to that place and time it was the atmosphere of the place and time and it was an accurate depiction of what was actually happening and I don't know how, I don't know how that happens anymore. And I, I think that, I, I mean, I don't even involve myself really in, in, in what's going on in the world anymore. I do, I do look, I am aware of it, but I don't get a sense of a unified time or place thing anymore. And I, you know, you can look at anything, you can look at any, any, any of, you know, you can look at the East Village in the 80s in New York, it has a very de definite uh, gestalt, and it's the same thing with San Francisco punk, and it's the same thing with, um, you know, ver various other places that had their scenes going on. So I don't know, I don't know what, what this means for the future. Apparently, you know, I don't know even have one anymore <laughs> yeah no no it's um it's it's uh it maybe one reason why i latch on to uh these things in the past so it's at least some uh some uh sort well, of to re yeah, yeah and to record to record it and to you know to to kind of analyze it um what made this possible and you know why have we how, how is this change going to affect the future because you know i did say that one of the big realities of of that time and we talked about it was i knew i met all of these old beatniks i met a lot of really famous old fucking hippies and beatniks and at the time it meant nothing to me but i look back and i go man i can't believe i met that person and i wish i had understood more but it, they were they those people weren't dead they were still living in san francisco and they were interacting with young people because they, you know, uh, people have this idea that you're only an artist when you're young, but it's not true. When you're an artist, you're an artist your whole life. So we were young artists and we were interacting with what I thought were old artists. But I look back and I go, you know, I think they were only in their 40s or 50s, <laughs> but they seemed really old at the time. Yeah. But, and that's like an amazing thing. Like when I look like when I'm reading about stuff from like, I'm reading a book about uh, the beat beats and, um, and I look back and, you know, and I'm like, it's amazing. Like, I, I can't believe that I actually got to meet some of those people. And I, and there's this thread that goes back from the San Francisco beats and the whole, you know, West coast um, uh, beat thing. And then the hippies and what I was saying about Hayden Market, where I lived on Golf and Market, you know, when I first moved there, there were still old um, stores from the, you know, Haight-Ashbury, where there was a head shop called the White Rabbit and the um, Jefferson Airplane House was still there and it was all painted black. And so there was still this um, residue of, the summer of love, and not to mention that there were, you know, you know, acid damaged hippies still wandering around. So, um, you know, it's that it's that continuity. It's like when I lived in when I was young and I lived in Italy. You lived with continuity every day because you lived in a place that was, you know, had 
thousands of years of history that you lived with. You walked down the street and, and you saw it. So you had a real understanding of history and continuity. And San Francisco had the same thing. 150, 100, 130. Yeah. And that's still something. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it had that real American. Um, well, you know, when you think about American art, you think about, you know, the beats and, um, and, you know, all those coffee shops that they hung out in and all the uh, strip clubs and bars that they went to, they were still there. They were just, you know, run down and fading away, but they were still there and they still had the same uh, decor even. And so we were going, I used to go to, uh, I, I had listened to all of these uh, girl jazz singers that my mom had all these records. So I grew up listening to her records and I loved the girl jazz singers. And when I moved to San Francisco, they still had all these jazz clubs. And um, a friend of mine who was an older gay man who was lived in the building I lived in, he used to take me to see these um, big jazz singers, big ones. And we'd go to these little cocktail lounges where you'd sit at a little cocktail table and you'd get dressed up and, you know, the jazz band would play and the singer would come out and sing. I mean, that's like amazing. I can't believe I got to do that. Was, was that still up in, uh, would that still be North Beach where that would? It was in North Beach and in the Tenderloin, there were still these jazz clubs. They okay. were still there. It was, uh, it was crazy. And I, you know, that you'd walk in and you'd sit at a little cocktail table and there'd be a little stage and they were, I, you know, I guess that was probably the tail end of them just dragging out their existence. You're, you're the one who first mentioned uh, the Harry Crosby book, uh, Black Sun. Oh, and, Black Sun, yeah. yeah Did you find a copy? I, no, I got it and, and I read it and it actually had a big impact on, uh, I read it not, I think we talked in 2018 and so I read it twenty later that year, I think. Uh -huh. And uh, then I interviewed John Savage the next year or a year later and he yeah. uh, he mentioned and just in his email, like he, he came from the UK to California in 1978 and he went to, to LA first and he unprompted mentioned uh, riding the bus from LA to San Francisco and reading that Harry Crosby book. Uh, oh, are the, you serious? And so I guess it had just recently come out, but yeah, it, it, it because there are so many parallels between uh, the way Harry Crosby lived and the way people like, uh, you know, unfortunately, Will Shatter uh, lived. And there's there's a line on the back cover of that uh -huh. book that says, uh, you know, he uh, killed himself to make his life a work of art. You know, he was doing it in Paris in the 20s. They were doing it in San Francisco in the 80s in their own right. way. And I think that was the other parallel. Well, those those. Yeah, totally. And those. Um, well, you know, uh, I'm I'm. I've been reading nonstop about Alistair Crowley for the past three years. I can't stop reading about him. And it's, and he was, he parallel paralleled a lot of those scenes. Like he was, uh, he was from the Edwardian age, but then he was in Paris in the twenties and he was in Berlin in the thirties. And then, you know, he was in America and he, he, uh, there was just a swath of, tragedies and death in his wake and the thing about people that choose to go and live dangerous lives people die that that's part of it like that's part of the appeal to not leading an ordinary life right there's you're taking a risk you, you could win it all you could lose it all and and it's death obsessed it's always been all the romantic po poets you know from from the beginning of the 19th century, it was the same thing. Um, Lord Byron, Shelley, um, William Blake, it's its the same mindset. So you, you're in the prime of your life, you're full of you know, youth and beauty and you go out to challenge the world and people die. And, and that's part of the, part of the draw. Like you don't know if you're gonna, what's gonna happen. So yeah, a lot of people did die. I hope I don't sound callous. You moved 
moved and uh, Adam Parfrey moved to New York and I, I can't remember who moved first. Oh, Adam mm -hmm. moved to, yeah, Adam moved to New York and then uh, he said, why don't you come to New York? I'm doing a magazine called Exit. And uh, so I thought, fuck it, I'm going to New York. So I went to New York and I moved in with Adam and uh, lived with him. And I, that's where I met George Petros because he and Adam did Exit Magazine. So we lived on um, third and between C and D in the East Village and we did Exit Magazine. And how long did that go? Was that based in New York the whole time or did, did he take that? Oh, uh, no, he, by the time or... he left New York, he was done with it. Uh, yeah, it was, we, well, we did, uh, we did, um, well, I got there in 84 and I think the last one we did was in 92 and then maybe one more might've come out after that, like a best of, like a big compilation one. And um, by the time Adam left to go to Portland, I don't think uh, he, I don't think he, uh, yeah, I think it was done by then. I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure. So yeah, the, I went to New York because Adam said come to New York, so I went. Okay, and how would you, for people who haven't seen Exit, I've only just read about it, but how would you describe it? Uh, well, Exit was, uh, it was black and white and it was based on serial art, which I brought up earlier. So the whole idea was serial art, but it wasn't, it wasn't a graphic novel and it wasn't, it wasn't comics. And it was um, a large format. It, you know, it was black and white illustration. And then Adam did, a, Adam would write and he would do um, a lot of visual material to go with the things he was writing about. And uh, George did illustrations and he did, um, uh, collage type stuff and he did a lot of writing but I just did I just did um illustrated stories so um and then then there, there were a lot of people in it Marilyn Manson was in it um Joe Coleman um Robert Williams are you familiar with the, Alex Gray was in it um I believe Alex Gray was in it uh uh, Ro Robert Pettibone, who used to, is it Robert Pettibone? Who used to, oh, Raymond. Raymond uh, Pettibone. Yeah, everybody was in it. And um, yeah, it was great. And um, it was, yeah, it was really good. I, I'm proud of the work I did in it. I wish I could do all the work over because I made a lot of, I, I'm much better now than I was then, but I had a lot of, you know, I was young and I had a lot of ability to just throw my ideas out there without laboring over it. But what do you remember about the founding of, uh, of, of feral, feral house? Did he leave New York with that idea in mind or how, what was the timetable on that? Well, um, uh, he must've started in feral house in New York cause he was doing apocalypse culture and he wanted, and that was one of the big, um, mistakes in my life. He wanted me to do some illustrations for apocalypse culture. And I I did some, but I wasn't taking him very seriously. And I he didn't like what I did. So I never I was never in apocalypse culture. <laughs> Which to this day I'm still irritated about, but whatever. And so he must have he must have been starting it in New York, but then he left and he went to Portland. And that's where he did Feral House. So, but I remember he was working on apocalypse culture when he was in New York. So, I, but I don't, I don't remember the whole timeline. But um, and you know, then he went down to LA, and then then he moved up to Port Townsend when I was in Portland. So then, when I moved to Portland, we started being friends again, again, and you know, spending time together because he would come to Portland and I would go up to Port Townsend. Okay. Yeah. You know, I wanted to ask about that because I, I just remembered and I, I just opened it up here. This uh, Head Press, who's you know publishing the book, they had a post a few weeks ago that said it's banned books week. So of course we're feeling a bit nostalgic for the 1990s alt culture weirdness that Head Press sprung from. 
and I think apocalypse culture was like even late eighties, but the, the first uh, featured image is the cover of uh, apocalypse culture. You know, that was kind of the wild west. And I think that's another thing that uh, we're talking about things that have become lost. Uh, they say this, the idea that, yeah, yeah, that, that certain things could be in, in a certain amount of bad taste or, or questionable taste oh, without, without being, yeah. Like exit magazine. We would do whatever the, f- fuck we wanted to do and we would never be able to do that now and yeah underground publishing was great when when people you know like when people people that don't know this world you know they you know i say i'm an artist and they just think that means you're an idiot an asshole (laughs) and you try to you know make excuses for yourself no 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 really i have fans i swear i have fans and then you try to explain well, what did you do? Were you in galleries? And you're like, well, I did an underground magazine. <laughs> and people are like, whatever. You know, they don't give a rat's ass. But it was it was a big deal. It was a big deal. Everybody looked at Exit. All the art directors looked at Exit. Everybody looked at Exit. And it was, you know, that was that was not an easy thing to put out. Because it was a physical magazine that had to get printed at an actual printers and we didn't use computers to lay it out we we laid it out manually we had to go to the stat shop and get stats and we had to lay everything out and take it to the printer so you know it wasn't it was hard it was a lot of work that was you and adam and george petros as the the three principals well i was it was george and adam were the principals and i was like the house artist so to speak i was the muse I, I mean, you know, I, it, George and Adam were the publishers. And I was, you know, I was an illustrator amongst a lot of people, but I was, um, I don't know, George always says that, he always says that, you know, exit wouldn't have been exit without me, but I don't, you know, hopefully that's true. I mean, my work is very different from uh, what everybody else does. So I think that that, you know, that is true. You know what I'm saying? My stuff is more romantic and every everybody else's was more kind of hard, hard edged, you know, more, more, um, more punk. My, my work was never really that punk unless I was actually illustrating something that was supposed to look punk. I, I used to do some really great classic punk illustrations for Damage magazine, but that was, you know, that was like illustrations I would do, but Anyway, we were talking about exit, but yeah, that was a great time period. That was all the 80s, 80s into early 90s um, underground, underground publishing, which is what Feral House was. Yeah, and w- when that came to an end, was that, uh, did you feel like it was like uh, just the end for exit or was that, that era kind of ending in general? Was it like early 90s? Yeah, that was that was the early '90s. Well, um, yeah, I, I guess at the time I really didn't think about it. Definitely, that was the end of my uh, foray into publishing. Um, I did go, you know, I did. I was working in publishing, but I wasn't doing any un, any underground art. And um, and I, you know, all through San Francisco, up through Exit Magazine, I had been and. Um, after the, I still did stuff for the toiling midgets, but um, all that was pretty much come to an end. I know you're still obviously still doing art, um, and it's not fair to ask you to catch us up from the end of exit to what you're doing now. But could you describe what kind of art you're doing now, and maybe if there is any connection to what you were doing back in in the eighties? Did sure. you see any connection? Yeah. Oh yeah, there, of course there's a connection. It's like my my art is. I've always had a specific vision since the time I was really young and I have, I've just been working. I've really been working on the same body of work my whole life, but now it's matured and it's coming to fruition after a lot of a long, hard slog. So everything that I'm doing now is just an extension of what I was doing then only now it's, you know, it's more refined and it's more sophisticated. But um, yeah, I'm doing, I mean, now I exclusively, I I just do oil paintings, you know, these really complicated 
neo-romantic uh, symbolist oil paintings, which are really telling the same stories. In fact, sometimes a couple of, of the paintings are, are literal um, reworkings of uh, exit illustrations. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever mentioned that. I don't, you know, I don't do a painting like, oh, I'm just feeling inspiration. I'm going to just go and, you know, slap some paint on the canvas. All of my paintings are, are pretty traditional and they tell a story. So before I started painting, I do a lot of drawings. I do a lot of research and I develop, you know, the story and the painting, the composition. I work out all the details. And, and a lot of times I will, you know, go through my archives to find something that's going to be the theme for a new piece. And a couple of of my oil paintings are actually taken straight from illustrations from Exit. Like, especially there, there's one uh, see, uh, one story that I did on alien abduction. I don't know if you got a chance to see that, but it's like, you know, that was alien abduction was big then. It was like Bud Hopkins did... Um, what was the book he did? Oh, communion and all that. And um, so I did uh, I did a, a piece on alien abduction. And, and there's one panel that I really love of a, a, a body that the aliens have dumped in a, a cemetery, you know, and he's been um, disemboweled. <laughs> and he's like fallen like on this hill next to a gravestone. And it, it was it was such a great illustration but I didn't execute it very well so I did I did that as a full-on oil painting not a big one a small one and it came out great I really loved it and I did a couple of exit pieces as full-on um, illustrations because all of my exit pieces were really just black and white compositions that easily could be paintings and then when I started when I made a turn and started really doing a really great um, oil paintings, then it was natural to just pick them up. So yeah, it's pretty much, my paintings are just uh, the same stories I've been telling my whole life, just now in a, a more sophisticated and complicated manner. So um, it's the same, the same story. Really, I started telling the story when I was really young, I'm still telling the same story, so. I lived in, when I lived in San Francisco, I was a really great painter. I made really, I, my art, my art was fat, fantastic. And I sold a lot of art and people collected it. And, you know, I'm really proud of the work I did and the people that bought it. But then when I went to New York, I was a really shitty painter, which is just unbelievable. I mean, really bad. I don't know what happened, but I didn't know. I thought I was really good. So I was kind of, you know, cocky and arrogant. And um, then I went to Portland and uh, in Portland, I just closed myself off and I went into my studio and I just worked. And I didn't even really show anybody anything I was doing. And now, you know, I'm now I've left Portland. I'm coming out now. I'm showing people what I'm doing. And, you know, you know, people, you know, the people have seen it so far. They like it. It's good. So, so when you said New York, what do you think being in New York changed the way you painted? I, you know, I don't know what it was about New York. I get, I think a part of it, yes, it, something happened. First of all, it's, you know, it's hard to get any space to actually work in New York. So that's one thing. And then also, you know, I was running wild in San Francisco, but I was really went, running wild in New York, especially New York and the East Village in the 80s. That was like pretty much, you know, nonstop partying. And um, and then, but that's fine. You know, that's to be expected. You're young and you're beautiful. You're living in New York. You're going to act like that, right? And, um, but then uh, in the 90s, uh, I just got really bogged down. I, I, I was in a bad marriage and I, I, I think I lost my, way I lost my confidence maybe and um I just you know I I just was not very good and I would try to break out of that 
morass that I was in, but I really, you have to be aware of what you're doing wrong in order to get out of it. And I just wasn't aware of it. So, um, I, uh, I thought, you know, I was really doing great work. I mean, I guess that's the bottom line. You know, you meet people like that all the time, don't you? That they they think that they're really doing great work, and you're like, well, dude, I hate to tell you, but you're not. <laughs> right. I mean, it's true though. How many people do you meet like that? And you're like, I meet people that do fabulous work, and I want to tell them, like, I love your work, and I want to talk to them about it, and I want to know about it. But mainly you meet people that just want to be artists and they do really bad work. And um, you can't say anything because you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings and you don't want anybody to get mad at you. But, um, and it was funny because at the time in New York, I had reached out to Joe Coleman, uh, you know, you know, give me some help here, Joe. <laughs> and he said, um, well, you're not really that, you're not really that good. And I'm like, I was really hurt. I, I, I was like, I can't believe that he said that to me. And when Adam died and I was down, I went down to LA because I was in a group show at La Luz de, de Jesus and they were doing a memorial for Adam uh, at the same time. And I went to the memorial and Joe Coleman was there and a lot of people from Adam's world were in there and people that I knew. And I had a couple of drinks in me and I went up to Joe and I said, remember that time in New York, you told me I wasn't any good. <laughs> Did he remember? <laughs> I don't know if he remembered or not. And I go, that really hurt my feelings, Joe. And he goes, well, are you good now? And I go, yeah, I'm great now. He goes, well, then, there you go. I hope I helped. And I'm like, yeah, you probably helped. Yeah, you know, he probably did help because that nagged at me, you know. I was like, you know, I didn't confront it, but it nagged at me. Like, you know, well, what did he mean by that? I think I'm pretty good. And, um, but I, you know, I got that a lot in New York because that's the way it is in New York. People are pretty brutal, but maybe it's better to be brutal with people than not. But I think it's just, um, I think New York is very hectic. Painting, you need a lot of calmness. You need a lot of quiet. You need a space to work and you need time to work in. And without those things, you just it's very difficult. And in New York, you're running around you're doing things, um, you're living life, you're experiencing the world, especially New York before 9-11. And um, it's just it's just very hard to calm down long enough to, to make a decent painting. I realize that now because uh, it took me 10 years into living in Portland before I started doing any decent work. So really it's only been the past fifth, maybe 15 years. And that came about because I stopped running around like a lunatic, you know, and I just went into my studio and I just worked. It made all the difference in the world, you know, take, you know, cause it's time consuming. You need quiet, you need to focus. And it takes, especially the kind of paintings I'm doing cause they're, they're very, you know, detailed and traditional. So, um, yeah, I think it's just a, you know, for some people they're good when they're young I was good when I was young, but I was terrible, you know, in my thirties and some people, it just takes longer. It definitely took me a long time, but I've been working since I was very young. So like 13. So it's taken me a lifetime. Was there ever a time when you were, you were out of, of it? It's always a balancing act to find time to devote to it versus day job stuff, I guess. Well, I, 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 I will, I will answer that because that time happened when I made the move from Portland to Arkansas. I okay. just started painting I about a month ago. So for seven months, I literally didn't do anything. I didn't make a drawing and I didn't do anything. And that's the first time that's ever happened in my life. And I was freaking out because I work every day. Now, some days you can't, you know, because it's just things happen and you can't. But when I'm in my routine, I work every day. And um, if I'm not painting, I'm drawing. And um, but I never am not doing 
not working in my studio. So for seven months, I made the move. I closed up my studio in the end of December. And then I moved and I sat here for seven months and I, I didn't do anything. And I, and I, it was, I was like, I can't believe that I'm not working. It's like so freaking weird. And I'm like, I can, I can see never working again. Now I can, now I know why people don't do anything. <laughs> this is kind of nice. <laughs> you, you didn't have that before at any point? <laughs> no, I'm not. No, because you know what? I'm all, I'm in a routine and um, I go to my studio at the same time every day and I just stay in there. And if, and if I'm doing good work, then it's good. And if I'm doing shitty work, I just keep going and I just, you know, power through it. And, um, I do, I do the work, whether or not I feel like it. Painting is not fun. People think, Oh, you must be really nice to have that therapy. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know what the fuck you think painting is, but it's, it's certainly not therapy. It's work. And I just am, I'm in the routine of work and um, I just get, you know, I get, I just put myself in the process and I just go and do the work, whether I want to or not. And again, sometimes I can't like today, obviously we're doing this. I'm not painting. And yesterday I couldn't because I, if I have too much uh, pay, you know, job work to do, then I physically can't do it. But I, I try to stick to my routine. And that's how I've gotten the work done by just being unrelenting. You know, when I lived in New York back in the East Village days, I was doing really bad work then, but it got worse. <laughs> but back in the East Village days, there was there was no place to paint in the East Village, like literally no place to paint. So I rented studio space at 135 Plymouth and underneath the Manhattan Bridge, which is now they call it Dumbo. Now it's a really built up area, but then it was a very dangerous, desolate uh, part of Brooklyn. It, they filmed a lot of movies there, like um, Once Upon a Time in America and all those gangster type movies, you know, any, any, any New York movie where they're going to kill somebody underneath the Manhattan Bridge, that's where they filmed it. <laughs> and um, so 135 Plymouth was a really famous uh building they filmed a lot of movies around it but it was a big warehouse and it had a lot of artist spaces spaces in it and so i had a i shared a studio space for years there and i had to um go to my studio from the east village to down underneath the manhattan bridge and dude it, that was a scary trip and i would we had no phone so I would have to, um, I'd have to call, I take the subway, but then I would call a car service and I would tell them when to pick me up. Right. So I'd have to estimate how long I was going to be there. And sometimes I'd be really overly ambitious. <laughs> I'd be like six hours, you know, it's come and get me in six hours. <laughs> so I'd be stuck in 135 Plymouth and, and late at night all by myself. And I'd have to work whether I wanted to or not because, you know, I couldn't call the car service. <laughs> so I think that I developed this really good habit of just going to my studio and staying there no matter what. No, that is that is good. I, you know, I I I have to say, like for for me, uh, it was graduate school and writing my dissertation where I had to get used to working on something every day, whether I wanted to or not. Uh, you know, help me, help me do this. Help me realize what kind of routine I, I would need to, to have, because sometimes people say, oh, you like to write. And it's kind of like, oh, do I like it? It's like, I, I kind of dread it every day and have to build up to it and, and, uh, get myself in the right frame of mind to do it. But I wouldn't say that it's like, oh, I enjoy, I enjoy sitting at the pit, you know, choosing my words carefully and, and, it, and it's tough. So I can relate a little bit, even though. Oh, no, it's, yeah, it's totally the same because it's the exact same thing. People think that when you go into your workshop or your studio to make something that you're ha you're out there having a blast. It's like, no, it's, it's work like any other kind of work. And um, it's can be very boring and it can be very tedious. And especially painting is it, the kind of painting I do is very tedious. And, um, 
you know, somebody said to me the other day, they said, uh, so, uh, you know, I was talking about, you know, I'm having problems with the painting and they know nothing about painting. I don't even know why I brought it up. And just cause I wanted to vent. And um, they said, well, you know, I can see that it's hard to have inspiration. You know, you can't always get inspiration. I'm like, that's painting is not about inspiration. By the time you've gotten to the part where you're actually working on the painting, the inspiration part's long gone. That that started way before you even got on, even before you started putting it on the canvas. That that part happened when you were concepting it. Once once you get to the painting part, that's the work part, and it's just like I'm gonna slog away at this thing until I fucking finish it, you know, because I've developed you know, this habit of work and this discipline and I have a vision that I'm executing, but yeah, it's not, it's not fun. There's nothing fun about it. Yeah. It's not, not fun, but there is, there is something, I mean, it, it, it obviously it feels meaningful in ways that, uh, I mean, you as a, an artist, I mean, you could certainly, uh, if, if your motivation was to, to make more money, you could channel your efforts into, to those areas, uh, just like, I mean, there's only so much money one could make writing, but I, I could I could certainly do things that were more uh, uh, lucrative. Uh, so there's something that we get that's satisfying about this. Oh, yeah, it's not so, fun. I don't yeah. mean, yeah, I don't mean to say it's not. It is. I like to be in my studio, and I like to, you know, I listen to podcasts, and I. I like, I don't want anybody to bother me. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want anybody to call me up. And I just go in my studio and I'm in there working and I, that's my favorite space to be in. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, that's that's home for me. That's where I want to be. And so, yeah, totally. But um, it's not, you know, you know, it's more fun to lay on the couch and watch a movie or read a book that's way more fun but um yeah that my favorite place to be is in my studio working and listening to a podcast and just you know just working away you know working working away and and you know constructing a, a really beautiful picture and then when the picture is done looking at it you know a, a really great painting you can look at it for years and it will always change and it will always look different. And, and then when I think of painters that I really love and pictures that I, you know, worship and I, you know, that really mean a lot to me in my life. It's like the fact that those people created those pictures and so many people know not, you don't, don't understand the process. They know nothing about them, but yet I'm forever grateful for them for having done it, you know, like life without uh, paintings would just be just bleak, just totally bleak. Because painting tells everything, you know, it's like an inner, it's the inner thoughts of a person, but it's the inner thoughts of an age. It describes the gestalt, it um, tells the story. Um, and it's, it's a really important thing. I want to do a book, um, so and it would be kind of like Exit, where it would be black and white. And it, in my Exit illustrations, I would do the illustration and I would do writing because I, I do like to write. And I would I would do like hand, you know, I, my whole thing was writing by hand and then incorporating it into the illustration. So um, I would like to do a book. I would like to do a book. The problem is, is that I haven't, I haven't, um, I haven't crystallized, I haven't verbalized the exact idea. I, the idea is, is made up in the images that I'm creating, which follow this theme that I have discussed. But I want to tell this, es the story of the, of the esoterica of the 20th century, that's the, the, this road that we've traveled I've traveled to to get here, which is um, my grand thesis is, are you ready for this one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so like in the 19th century, all of the really great writers and artists were syphilitics. 
because syphilis was running rampant. They didn't yet have a cure for it. And um, when I was young, I was obsessed with 19th century French literature. So I read all of these great 19th century French writers. I was just absolutely obsessed with them. them. Well, it turns out that they, the majority of them were syphilitic. And so like Nietzsche was a syphilitic, apparently Aleister Crowley was a syphilitic and he was from the same era. He was an Edwardian. He was young, but he was an Edwardian. And so there is this theory and actually some of the, these great artists of that time period, the late 19th century, believe that until they got syphilis and they started going mad, they, they would never truly be a genius. They believe that syphilis somehow made people geniuses. And there were writers that were very ordinary pedestrian writers until they started, you know, you'd get syphilis and then you'd start going downhill and then they'd have this burst of genius. And so I think that we are the offspring of these syphilitic 19th century geniuses. Because, you know, any, any artist, right? Any artist that's a real artist, they're, they're working in a void, right? They don't, you know, they're not gonna be, they may or may not be recognized, but they're, they're, they're picking up on something that's gonna happen down the road. They don't even know what they're picking up on. So they're, they're like a radio and they're picking up these signals. And then they, they kind of describe it, they talk about it, they put the idea out in the world, people don't really understand what they're talking about. But then later it starts to manifest itself. And then you can kind of look back and you can, you can kind of pull the threads together. So I kind of think that that's what's going on here, that there was, you know, they have the, there's this idea that um, human being, you know, the idea that human beings were, um, you know, we would just be animals were it not for like a parasite or a virus that changed us. And that, that like human civilization is really just the byproduct of parasites, uh, you know, changing the living organism and uh, syphilis is, it, it is like a paras it is a parasite. I it's a living thing that you get in your body that then starts changing you. So if, you know, if that's true, you know, like they say, uh, what made um, evolution or what made, you know, life on earth and, oh, did, did an asteroid, you know, deposit viruses on the earth and is that what made it so if that's true then it would make sense that um the unleashing of syphilis that created these geniuses that then formed us created the place that we're at now because we are living we are living byproducts of this occult uh, edwardian vision we are living in a cult in occult times and it is now it's now, it's now part of, it's people, it's just part of the, every, people like, it's pop culture now, like you could find a, a children's backpack in Walmart with imagery that's a cult on it. So how, you know, this is, this is like sacred knowledge that people used to, it used to be hidden, now it is no longer hidden, and, but now it it's manifesting in, in, you know, there was a reason it was hidden because it wasn't meant for most people. Most people don't even understand it. They're never going to understand it. And it's, and it's dangerous, right? It's like dangerous. It's supposed to be hidden for a reason, but now it's like part of everyday life and, and how, and, and it does, there is an unseen world and it is, it is the, you know, it is the uh, verbalization of the unseen world. And now that that's out into the hands of the common man, what's the next, what's the next phase going to be, right? You know, what is the next phase going to be? In the past, I do believe that the strength of, of like, of Christian piety kept that in check. But now that that is no longer in place, what will hold the dark forces back? You know, th they can, they can, you know, they can travel between dimensions and worlds. And, uh, you know, when you read enough about Aleister Crowley, you see, you see, you know, you, you read about it, you know, you, you actually read about things that did manifest. And, and I know from my time living in 
that dark world in San Francisco because things did get very dark. Things, things, things did manifest. And in, in, I think part of my obsession with reading about Crowley is because I see parallels. And because the, the times that when he was young and he was an Edwardian, it was very, very similar to uh, the San Francisco days in particular and some of the New York days and that you were going to these very dark places and then things would start manifesting. They, they went through the exact same things as did um, like Byron and Shelley and that crew in uh, the early part of the 19th century. So it's definitely, um, it's, a, it, it's a thing, it's a, it's a part of the human experience that manifests, but it, it get, it's been pushed down for a long, long time, and it started to bubble up, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely some some stories that get a little paranormal in the in the San Francisco book, but uh, that wasn't that wasn't a meant to be like a guiding theme. But it it comes up again and again, often in conjunction with drug hallucinations. But again, that could oh, be it's, it's, that could be its own medium for for a. No, that's yeah. that's drugs do that. That is, it's people say, oh, it's hallucination or drugs. That's the thing. Drugs open up portals. Crowley was a ter- he. It was he used drugs in his occult rituals to to like pierce the veil between the two worlds. So people that use drugs recreationally, they don't realize what they're doing. And when you see like what's going on in San Francisco and L.A. and Portland and all that with this rampant street drug use and this you know, this animalistic behavior where people are, are literally, people go oh, like that's, they look like they're demons. Well, they are, those people are getting them. They are a, a lot of the times, I truly believe they have actually, they are demon possessed at that point because they've, when you're in that state, you allow yourself to be possessed by demons. That's what happens. And, and that happened a lot in San Francisco back in that day, in the day, in those days, that did happen a lot. And I saw manifestations of it. For me, I was always like very uh, between two worlds, like, you know, very space, spaced out and, and uh, not seeing things clearly. But I was always, man- you know, I was always, I would just make pictures and then other people would see it. And um, so I was, I was channeling that myself, but in just in pictures, not in anything that I was doing, but I was you know, kind of psychically picking it up and I'd make a picture and, and then somebody else who was experienced it would see it. And they, and then I was starting to make the connection, you know, I'm like, oh, I just think I'm making a picture, but I think I'm actually picking up on something that's going on and I don't really realize it, but now I'm looking at these people, they're pretty far gone. They're on a lot of drugs. People are dying Uh, with the Gomez situation and at the a-hole, that's what happened when Gomez died, I started making all these paintings, small paintings on paper, and his girlfriend kept buying them all. I'd make one and she'd buy it. And, and I was like, it's so weird. Why does she keep buying all these pictures? And then one day I was kind of having, you know, drifting around having these thoughts. And I, I was looking at this picture and it was, um, I still have that one. It was somebody looking in a mirror and the reflection looking back in the mirror. And I had this epiphany, I'm like, I'm like, she, she knew, she knows she killed him. It was an accident and I'm painting these pictures and they're, and it's telling the story and she sees it and she's buying it all up because she doesn't want anybody to know. And I had this epiphany. And then I realized Gomez did not commit suicide. I think that they had an argument and she accidentally shot him and she didn't mean to do it. They had guns all over the place all the time. Yeah, that that was that was in that period of deaths. Uh, that was kind of bang, bang, bang uh, in the, uh, especially in that period of the book. Yeah. So yeah. So it's um, and it, you know the Crowley thing. It's the same thing. People are dying all over the place. Like people are constantly dying, and and that's that. You know, that's that. You choose to go to that, you know, to that place. You're like, I'm going to live life to the fullest and I'm going to go out there. I'm going to try to make my mark in the world and I'm going to experience life. And, you know, like we started off the conversation, it is Russian roulette. You don't know if you're going to make it out alive. And that's part of the glamour and the attraction of it. That's why 
there's so much death imagery, you know, sex and death. There's a lot of sex and a lot of death. And, and that's what makes it glamorous. And that's why, so now, you know, in pop culture, you know, especially with all the pop surrealism, which is the only kind of art that anybody cares about now, it's all about, you know, sexy girls and skulls and shit like that. It's the, it's the most um, facile, juvenile way to represent one of the, you know, the most profound thing in the world, which is sex and death. It's been that's how dumbed down it's become. But um, maybe it's maybe you know maybe that's a perfect like you know full circle of the whole you know gestalt of this meaning me, this conversation is that um, so we were all physically together physically together running around you know taking drugs having sex making art um, having this real high intense beautiful life that was also very dangerous and deadly and um, and creating art that actually had meaning because it reflected the time and the place and um and now if people are not meeting in person they're not running around and having that bohemian artist experience and the art that they are producing is just shallow and stupid it's a cliche it's like you know you think of you think of monk he, you know, he was an ex a German expressionist and his his famous pictures of sex and death. And you compare that to uh, what is it like Megan the Stallion and uh, <laughs> what's her name doing these horrible occult, you know, MTV rituals with sex and, you know, rhinestones, sugar skulls and shit like that. <laughs> this is, you know, that's yeah. that that's the perfect juxtaposition, right? That's our sex and yeah. So yeah, it's, so maybe, you know, maybe it's like, you know, it's like um, to a certain extent that punk rock sex and death of San Francisco in that time period and New York was a more nuanced. It was more subtle. And, it, it, you know, if you look at old pictures of New York back in the day, I mean, it was, it, it, people were really out there, but they were kind of, classy and subtle compared to what's going on now and um you know um you you get this wave of nostalgia you're like man people kind of looked really cool then. <laughs> and um now i just you know there is a you know there's a loss of style and there's a loss of a depth i guess really to me that seems that way yeah, I think it's. I think. Uh, I think I used the term "last gasp" at one point. Obviously, that's the name of a publisher. But the the kind of feeling uh, again, with the benefit of hindsight, looking back, it's like it was almost as if uh, there was some collective sense, even if it was unconscious, that that this was somehow a last a last gasp for for some uh, uh, period of culture, and maybe uh, maybe there were premonitions that uh, things were heading off the cliff, and. Uh, and that led to some of the the desperation or urgency or, or whatever it was that gave things the the charge that they had at the time um maybe and then it and it flamed out in in uh you know and it brought with it you know the the great things that came out of it and then also the uh you know the the tragedies as well and the the, the um you know or the, the deaths and, and all of that stuff so it was like um it just seems yeah it, and it's always hard to separate my own age from the, uh, t you know, the, the cultural things, because I was not this age in the 80s or 90s. But so many other people I talked to uh, seem to uh, reassure me that it's not just me, that, that we are passing through a very strange time and that uh, um, you can, yeah, you can look back at the late 70s and 80s and, and view it as if, wow, that was a really distinct era from now. Oh yeah, it went, and you know too, it, it, absolutely, and it had. It's very much like again, you know, Paris in the twenties, and 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 it's it's very much associated with a place and a time, and it's those those that ma magical combination of forces that create this definite thing that's tangible, and um, I, you know, I I I don't, you know, who knows what 
you know, does it or creates it, but it definitely, it's not just, it's not just like nostalgia and it's like, oh, you know, I was young and, you know, things were better. It's not that. It definitely had a very different feeling. I remember when, um, when, you know, I, I was asleep and Craig and Paul came and they woke me up and they played me the first, um, songs from the sea of unrest and it was like you know really like two o'clock in the morning and i woke up and i i it was like i to this day i can remember that feeling it was like this magical thing this beautiful like when you create a beautiful thing and you know that that's a real thing that's gonna you know it's gonna last it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna last through the ages because it's a true piece of art like when you when you encounter those things, you feel it in your gut and you know it. And that's what makes art real, what makes real art, real art, as opposed to just, you know, self-indulgence. And it speaks of something out of, you know, it's out of place and out of time. And I can still remember it. It was, it was totally, um, it was very profound and it was uh, really moving. And, and to this day, you know, if, it, if I'm driving, and one of those songs comes up, you know, and I'm not expecting it. And I, I'm just like suspended in time. And it's it's really just um, a very pure experience. And that's what art's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a profound and pure experience. And it's not an easy thing to achieve. And it has to be, all, all the right pieces have to fall into place in order that, for that to happen. And it can't be an avoid. You've got to have, those connections with people. I don't, I don't think it can be an avoid, especially when you're young and you're just finding out, you know, like you go out into the world, you're like, I'm going to be an artist. And it's one thing when you're older and you've learned your craft and you're on your road, but when you're young and you're, you're trying to figure out what the world is to have those real connections in real life and to have that mold you I don't think there's I don't think there's a replacement for it. And it's certainly not meta, okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's That's certainly cool. not meta.